I'm Beaver Trapper in Birmingham, and in this segment of the show, I'm hopefully going to share with you lessons that I've learned in the School of Hard Knocks. Hello and welcome to another edition of the School of Hard Knocks. Tonight we're going to talk about how to get started in prepping. One of the most fundamental mistakes that I see people make who are just getting into prepping is that they start prepping for the worst case scenario. They start trying to prep for terrorist attack or a breakdown in law and order or some other major calamity. And in my opinion, this is the absolute worst way to go about it. They're going about it backwards. What they need to do, instead of prepping for the worst case scenario, they need to prep for the most likely scenario. And I basically divide things into three categories when it comes to scenarios to be prepared for. And we'll talk first about the most common scenario, and this is what I call surviving the power outage. I know it sounds kind of funny, but most everybody has dealt with a power outage before, and we're all going to deal with power outages again. So it's something that you've faced in the past, and it's something that you know you're going to face in the future, so we might as well be ready to deal with it in the most efficient manner possible when it happens. So let's say you've just come home from work, and the power goes out right before you start fixing dinner for your family. So you've got a couple of problems to solve. The first problem to solve is what are you going to fix for dinner? Most people that have a well-stocked pantry, this is not a problem. There's canned goods, there's leftover and leftovers in the refrigerator, there's other ready-to-eat, no-cook foods that they have on hand. But, you know, you'd be surprised at how many people don't have a well-stocked pantry or basically live on a meal-to-meal basis. So one of the first things I would suggest is make sure that you have a well-stocked pantry. The next thing that I would recommend is for everyone to own a generator of some sort. Personally, I use a Honda EU series generator. It's a very quiet, very small, very portable, very fuel-efficient generator, and it'll put out about 2,000 watts. And this is more than enough to run a small microwave. American Life in many ways in the kitchen revolves around the microwave. Microwaves are great for heating up leftovers. You can cook some very good pre-prepared meals with your microwave. You can steam fresh vegetables. You can even fix uh, scrambled eggs or omelets with a microwave. So if you have a generator and a microwave, you're really not going to miss a beat when the power goes out. One of the other things that I always recommend is that people have what I call a lights out box. And basically, this is just a small container like a Tupperware container or a Rubbermaid tote where you keep flashlights, you keep a hand crank radio, you keep batteries, and things of that nature. And you make sure that everybody knows where it is, whether you're going to keep it under the bed or in some other place. And the idea being is that if the power goes out and you're in total darkness, everybody in the house can find their way to the lights out box and get a flashlight and get a form of communication where they can find out if there's a bad storm in the area or what's going on. So one of the most common problems that you have to face when you lose power is trying to move around the house um, in the dark. Everybody seems to think that they can rely on their camping gear or whatever flashlights they have laying around. And what I've found is over time that a headlamp is really not a good solution because when you put headlamps on everybody in your family, the next thing you know is it's a natural reaction. Every time somebody talks, they're, they're going to turn and look at you and you end up blinding each other. It's like shining a flashlight in somebody's face. And that gets pretty old pretty quick. You also find that carrying a flashlight doesn't really fill the bill because one of your hands is occupied and a flashlight basically is not an area light but it's a task light so to speak. 
Then when you turn to your lanterns, your usual camping lanterns, there are a couple of problems that you will encounter. Number one, I don't like any type of open flame as far as a light source is concerned. I don't like candles, I don't like propane lanterns, I don't like kerosene lanterns or anything like that. Number one, there's a fire danger. When you're moving around in the dark, people are going to be carrying their light source with them. If they go to the bathroom, they're going to carry the light source with them. If they move from one room to another, they're going to carry it. And if you're carrying an open flame or something that's hot, that's a fire danger and it's a potential burn danger. You can knock into it or brush up against it and get burned and injure yourself. In addition, there's an oxygen danger. When you are burning an open flame or a propane lantern or something like that, inside of an enclosed space you're going to reduce the oxygen level or the uh, carbon monoxide level and that's a danger. So I don't like to use open flames and especially if you live in the south in the summertime you're not going to be able to spend very much time indoors with a typical propane lantern before it simply becomes too hot to stay inside. So they're not good solutions. I prefer either a fluorescent lantern or an LED lantern. These lanterns are safe. They don't generate heat, so they're good to use in the summertime. And there's no burn danger. And, and like I say, in the summertime in the south, this is a must-have. Now, one of the most common problems that I see with the vast majority of lanterns on the market is that they're designed to be used in the outdoors or designed to be used camping. And they throw their light outward and not downward. They design these lanterns so that you can sit them on a picnic table and that they will illuminate the area around the campsite. This is not what you need inside your house when it's dark and there's no power. What you need is a lantern that you can hang from the ceiling or hang from a ceiling fan or hang from a light fixture that throws its light downward and not outward. And believe it or not, one of the most effective power outage lanterns that I have ever used is a very cheap, very simple lantern that you can buy at Walmart. And it's called, what I, I call it, the UFO tent light. The Walmart version is made by Ozark Trail. I think they sell for about 6 or $7. And basically, these are little tent lights that have 48 LEDs. They're circular and so this, therefore they look like a UFO. You can hang these lanterns from a ceiling fan pull chain, from a light fixture, from anything like that, and they throw a very even light, and the light is all thrown downward, and they illuminate the room evenly. They illuminate the floor where you're trying to walk, rather than shining into your eyes or illuminating the walls. If you just go to Amazon.com and type in UFO tent light, you'll be able to find these things. I keep a lot of these things on hand. These are great lights. So why am I spending so much time talking about a power outage, one night without power? Well, there's two reasons for that. Number one, the bottom line is I believe with the decline in our national infrastructure, we're going to see more frequent brownouts, more frequent rolling blackouts, and more frequent power outages. This is going to become normal rather than something that is unusual. So you might as well start preparing for it now. The second thing is that once you start preparing and get used to dealing with providing food, providing light, uh, and that sort of thing, being able to heat your house, and dealing with a lack of electricity in in the course of a power outage you're going to find out what works for you in your area and what doesn't and you're going to be able to parlay these ideas and these lessons learned into the next phase of prepping and that is surviving an ice storm or a hurricane or an event that is three days to a week in length and so you have to crawl before you walk and you have to walk before you run so I think rather than, if you're just getting started in prepping, rather than starting out trying to prepare for the end of the world or a collapse of the economy, start preparing for a power outage. 
and get that down build a little confidence make sure you have what you need then the next phase which we'll talk about in a future episode and that is a three day to a week long ten day event that is much less frequent in nature whether it be an ice storm a tornado or a hurricane or something of that nature and then after that once you have that phase covered then you can worry about a truly long-term paradigm shift whether it be a collapse in government an economic collapse a terrorist attack or something of that nature so anyway i hope this has been of value and until next time have a good night